All right, so what's up, everybody, and welcome to the Unsolicited Podcast from Detail Comics. And the reason it's called Unsolicited is because we're here making comic books that, well, evidently nobody wants. Um, but hopefully they do. Uh, you know, they didn't ask for them, but the, hopefully they want them, so that's the idea. Uh, so I'm Stan, and I'm from Detail Comics, and the idea behind this podcast, not just making comics, it's actually coming up with characters, concepts, storylines, to the point where we can actually produce art that's illustrated and lettered in, uh, you know, enjoyable for you guys, you know, a little primer for what would be to come if we turned it into a real project. So joining me today, again, I'm Stan from Detail Comics, I run the Detail Comics YouTube channel, and we have local artist Keegan Courier, who's here. You want to introduce yourself, Keegan? I'm Keegan. That's Stan did a pretty good job, but... I, uh, I draw things. Cool. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. No, you're okay at it. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> so where could they find you if they wanted to, you know, I'm going to try and scroll some of your art, you know, if you want to let me uh, borrow some of your art yeah, for the course. video and stuff like that. I'll scroll some of the art through over the course of this podcast on YouTube, but uh, do you have like a handle or a tag or anything like that? Uh, right now it's Instagram is probably the best way to do it. I'm working on a website, but my Instagram is just Geek and Career. Okay, cool. I'll put that on the screen as well, so you're going to see that. And then between us, I've been a fan of comic books since I was like a little kid, you know, like eight, nine years old, maybe a little bit before that. And then Keegan, you've probably been a fan of oh, comics yeah. and art for quite some time. And Pretty to, much the same time frame, yeah. Cool. So to keep us kind of sane, we have our straight man here, which is going to be uh, Mac. So uh, introduce yourself, Mac. What's going on, guys? I also daylight as Morgan Freeman. I don't think so. <laughs> Based on how you sound on this podcast, I really doubt anybody's this going to mistake you from Morgan Freeman. Uh, I appreciate the candor, though. You oh, know, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. Uh, so, like I mentioned before, this is a podcast about creating comic books or creating the concept behind comic books. And we have no idea really what we're doing. Like, I've never created a comic book. I've, like, written one script that's full for, like, one issue. But the idea is to, you know, give people a behind-the-scenes as to, you know, somebody that's trying to attempt to create their own. Mm -hmm. You know, what really goes into that process from start to finish. And the idea is that by the time the podcast is done, we've got everything that we need to put something out into the world that we could create as far as a pitch package is concerned. So a pitch package for people that haven't heard about it, have you guys heard about it? I know. I know about it, but okay. I can understand why you don't, Mac. <laughs> yeah, because you're you're not us. <laughs> so as far as the pitch package is concerned, really what it is, it's about a one-page synopsis of an entire story. So, you know, that's the spoilers and everything, really getting the gist of your story across. And then also you're going to have about five pages of fully illustrated artwork, including lettering and things like that, a, a good concept or an idea of what it's going to look like in finalized format, something that you could pitch to an independent publisher like Image or Black Mask or Boom Studios or someplace like that, so that that way they could be like, yeah, you, let's let's green light it. You guys still have to make it for free, but you know we'll pay you once you're done. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So yeah, so we have somebody here that's helping us build storyline, flush out characters, that kind of thing, details from the detail comics guru right here. Evidently, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have our resident artist to help us put these glorious images on paper, and then my job is going to be just kind of summing it up, as I'm trying to do right now, and just calling you guys nerds all You're just supposed to keep us in check. Like, if we yeah. say stuff that makes no sense to a... Like, you're kind of the audience, right? You're not the creator. You're just... You're more of uh, the checkpoint here. Okay. If something sounds weird... You're, you're, the, you're the balance in yeah. the force. You know, like, <laughs> if we get too far towards the Sith here, you know, we, wanna, we want you to bring us back to the light. You know, I, as, as cool as Darth Vader is, I don't want to be the whiny Kylo Ren, so just bring me back into the middle somewhere, and that'd be fantastic. Yeah. You're kind of supposed to bring us back in the middle of the road. Like, if we get too far in one direction where it's not really enjoyable for anyone except the people making it, that's where you step in and be like, no, I don't like this. This makes no sense to me. All right, moving forward. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So um, normally we'd actually have a bunch of different stuff. So first off, the idea is to create original content, but sometimes when we don't have original content to create, then we might pull from DC or Marvel. You know, I've got like a list of 200 different characters that we could pull from. Uh, we've got a bunch of different genres that we could deal with, like Western, hard sci-fi, and, you know, horror movies mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. So basically pulling from cinema and comic books to create these different concepts but to kind of get everything started we decided that we wanted to prime a little bit and we're starting with a title that we came up with at work and the title of this comic book that we're going to be developing here is my best friend the sleeper agent there we go 
Okay. <laughs> Okay, cool. We got a first mile out of Mac, so that's you know the it's definitely testing well with the twelve to sixteen year olds. Um, (laughs) (laughs) In reality, Mac is twenty one, but he does look like a small boy. So you know, it's just one of those things that you got to kind of kind of keep in mind. If you hear the door slam, it is me actually walking out. Okay, cool. Yeah, no. In Mac's defensive looking young. He's five years younger than me, and he can grow a better beard. So you have <laughs> that going. That's very you. true. That's very true. I did have those freakish friends in grade school, too. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as my best friend, the sleeper agent, uh, when that kind of title comes to, comes to mind, like, first off, what are we thinking here? So is this going to be, like, what kind of age bracket are the characters we're talking about? I'm thinking 24 to 28. So 24 to 28. So exactly your age. That's not true. That's... I'm 26. You're like right in the middle. <laughs> you're, you're smack dab in the middle of the average. But I'm not 24 or 28. That's true, but you know, you're in the middle. You're the best representation of the spectrum. We can extend it. I'm not opposed to doing like, you know, 33, 34. Maybe I want a 13 year old. 33, 34. I, okay, 24 to 28. I dig it. Uh, because okay. that's just, you know, somebody that's starting out, like if we're talking millennial lifestyle, they're in like their third job because they want to make a difference and they really can't. And they're starting to get broken <laughs> by life. Well, we've gotten <laughs> political. Right? Student debt is just weighing them down. It's <laughs> yeah. crippling, crippling well, student debt. Well, here's the thing, right? Because we're not talking about the sleeper agent guy. We're talking about the best friend, the sleeper agent. So this is the person okay. that's inside the job that is the friend of the person that ends up being, you know, the, the, the badass really of the story. But mm-hmm. it's all about the character development of the person that's next to him. Yeah. So that's who you're. That's the the gateway, the entry point for the person that is reading the comic book. They're going to identify with that person compared to, say, like the sleeper agent that's going to do all the badass stuff. Okay. So uh, when we're talking about that, we're talking what like where where do we kind of originate? We we've got a three act story here, so we got to kind of sum it up. We've got to put them in a situation. We've got to have a protagonist. We've got to have. Uh, you know, the outcomes and overall concepts and then the, the conflict resolution, something like that. Um, so this is going to be a pretty pretty easy arc, I, I feel. Um, what is... So first off, who is the protagonist? A very, on the surface, average-seeming person. Like, very, very average. Like average, maybe slightly above average intelligence, uh, average look, height, like... On appearance, nothing overly special about him. So he very much blends into the crowd. Yeah, he's he's like your C plus student. Okay, um, cool. No, I can get behind that. But his best friend has to be like the complete opposite. Almost like seems like he undersells himself. Right? It's okay. almost like why are these two hanging out with each other? That's what I picture. I picture someone like really tall, really good looking, but for some reason is just super into hanging out with like this very average person. So are we talking like you know? Our main character is like Chris Pratt in Parks and Rec, and then like our our best friend sleeper agent is like Christian Bale in American Psycho. That might be a little a little bit too polarized, but I like the Chris Pratt part. Okay, I'm thinking more like um, whoever the guy from Tron was. The newest one. Yeah, I have one. no idea who that is. I don't either. <laughs> I love I love Tron Legacy. You know, Tron. But you Legacy know the main great. character. Yeah, of Tron no, no, I, I do. You know, he's anyone listening like that might have to IMD be him. But yeah, kind of like that. Yeah, so like it's Chris that Pratt kind of from Parks and Rec, and then like Tron Mila Legacy, Kunovich or whatever. Huh. What? What? <laughs> I was gonna say I don't know if that's his name. Somebody needs to Google and comment his name in the in the the comments so that that way we know what we're talking about. But we've got a visual on what this is. So as far as this is concerned, uh, you know, this is an office job. This this is you know like mm-hmm. he's not making the difference that he really wants to make make in the world, uh, you know shaggyish hair when we're talking about illustration concepts, yeah. uh, you know definitely coming from a world where we're talking, uh, you know button up shirt tie doesn't have to wear his suit jacket the but entire like time. Disheveled button up shirt yeah. and tie like someone woke up late and tried to get to work on time and just did not have time to like fully present themselves. Right? Yeah, no, I totally get that. That's That kind of fits into the vibe that I'm really thinking of regarding this. But his friend, you know, who is, you know, of that upper echelon, even though he might like relax a little bit after work, he's definitely a very high and tight, slick back, you know, very put together oh, yeah. kind of person all the time. Yeah, like, he's never got wrinkled clothes. He's He looks slick. Right? Sweet. Cool. So he's got to make it from here. So our protagonist, what's his name? Because I'm thinking like I'm bad at naming things, so that's going to be you too. Okay, so I'm if, if I'm my future kids, if I'm thinking of a of a name, <laughs> uh, I want I want to to do something funny. So I want to do like you know I want to call him like David, and he likes to be called David, but everybody calls him like Dave or Don or or Dominic. Yeah, nobody uh, you know nobody calls him by his right name. Yeah. and then even when somebody gets Dave right, 
you know, he's just like, my name, my name is David. <laughs> you know, he's just, he's just like tries to quietly correct them and something along those lines, at least at the start of, of this kind of concept. So, you know, I want him to, to kind of like blend into the background. I want him to not necessarily be super assertive so that that way we can create a, a character arc that's really going to grow him as a person as he kind of gets thrown into the turmoil when he finds out that his best friend is a sleeper agent. So that kind of irons out where, where the character starts from. Uh, where does the character really kind of end? I think he might have to progressively become a little more, I don't want to say useful, but at the beginning of the story, I assume that his best friend's doing all the heavy lifting. Yeah, his no, that, that just makes the agent sense. friend, he's going to have to kind of develop a better situational awareness, have to be more involved with saving himself, and probably I'd hope to think it somewhat smarter or find some kind of purpose out of this. He said he's looking for something. Yeah. He's not making a difference in his life. Okay, cool. Let's uh, actually... Let's start with the opening scene. The opening scene of a comic book is like super important. That's one of the things that I've always thought because you've got this giant opening splash page. So that's gonna give across the, the content. It's gonna get you the idea as to what's gonna be going on in the actual storyline. So when we're talking about this kind of like office job, I'm thinking like, you know, 35th floor, skyscraper kind of kind of deal. And the first thing that I see, if we're talking mind's eye, uh, I see like staring up at like this tapering building and then a series of panels and it kind of cascades down. And the top panel is just, well, it's not even a panel. It's just the top of the building about where the office would be. And then there's a panel kind of inset over the building. It just looks like the building continues, but this panel shows a glass breaking in two small bodies coming out of the window. And then the panels kind of grow towards the bottom of it. And you just see them kind of cascading to the point where you've got like super composed, badass sleeper agent dude who's, you know, like there ready to like do whatever he's got to do in order to land after this 35 story drop. And then you've got Chris Pratt from Parks and Rec, you know, on his side, just kind of like flailing, ready to be saved. Right. You know, very damsel in distress like. Which I think most of us would be doing oh, if yeah. we were falling out of a building. That's Absolutely. Understandable, but I mean, we're we're comic book uh, in a comic book here. We can get a little bit fantastical with it. Maybe he's got some preparation. Maybe you know he's he's got some sort of escape plan so that that way there's like a you know like a hatch or an awning or something along those lines that can kind of break their fall and make it a little bit more safe. But this is his you know code red escape plan, and they just bust out of the window. Then it. It would be better if, you know, in the aftermath, it turns out that it was their boss's window. So he just, like, goes through the boss's office, and then they got, like, the boss's office, like, taped up as they're asking. And that way we can kind of give some backstory in the context of how other people perceived him and then get a better idea of who he is. Because if we're talking about okay. where this dude lives, man, he's middle-level apartment. You right. know, it's not in great repair. We're talking, you know, like, almost the poor side of town. Uh Empty pizza box on the coffee table, something yeah. along those lines. Like not gonna... boss doesn't really know how to describe him. He's like, he's like, he uh, might have worked here. He's he, everything that he said was he was a decent worker. You know, he uh, seemed to get shit done. <laughs> That's he's really not making it. waves though. No, he's he's, he's definitely he's not, not making, making waves. waves. But exactly. I think it's important that his friend also doesn't make waves of this job. Like his friend looks like he would be successful, but for some reason never really goes anywhere. So we're well, thinking... no, no, he declines his promotions. Yeah, but he just stays where he is, and everyone's like, okay, so are you, like, dumb It's like, dude? we've got a great corner office for you over here, Steve, so, you know, it, it's just, uh, it, are you ready to make the next step up? It's like, no, I don't really think that I've, I've fulfilled my role here, you know, in, in processing data entry. You know, I just, I just think I can do more for the company here. <laughs> so, like, the, he's that kind of guy. You know, he just seems like real good go-getter, but in reality, he's got a purpose. And the purpose is because... He's a sleeper agent, and he's sent there to defend what has become his friend. And we don't know why he is defending him for at least the first issue. You know, it's just we know that he's pulling him out of harm's way quite a bit uh, with no real intentions behind it other than it's just like it could be some, it's well beyond best friendmanship. You know, okay. it feels like there's a duty, there's a job that's associated with it. Oh, so, so we're not going full romance yet? Oh, well, I mean, no, he's like... They, there's you're going to flesh out the relationship over the course. How long is this series going to be? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Like, what uh, what are you thinking? We've got, we got links. You could what? tell a story in an issue, or you could tell a story in 12 issues, or it could be an ongoing series. I think it's got to have a finite end. Yeah. It's definitely got to have an end someplace. Uh, I'm thinking maybe 8 to 12. I mean, you could probably do the first arc in 4 to 5. <laughs> well, being the amateur comic book person here, how many, like... Pages is your standard comic book. Uh, usually it's about 22 pages of art. 
Okay. So there's there's more pages in an actual comic book, but that's because there's ads and stuff like that. But if you're talking about an independent book, it's anywhere from 22 to 30. Uh, you know, people that own their own, they want a little bit longer format for a standard comic book. They'll be up towards the 30 range, but 22 for for content and art is about pre, about standard for the industry. 22, 24. So I agree with Keegan. You know, keep it concise enough so that you know, put together. Don't draw anything out because it sounds like it's going to turn into this action ask, you know, playbook of how these guys go through their I- adventures together. Whatever that might be. Right. Right. So if we're OK, so uh, let's let's set this hard and fast down here. Uh, guys, 24 to 28. Uh, he is Chris Pratt from Parks and Rec. <laughs> um, and that's just that's just a, <laughs> that's just the best reference that I can possibly come up with uh, at this point in time. And then for length, uh, we're going to go somewhere between 8 and 12 issues, and that is going to be what, what you would define as a maxi-series. Like okay. in comic books, that's called a maxi-series, uh, because a mini-series would run somewhere under 6 issues. An average story arc, say like if you're writing a, a pretty standard story arc for a main character from DC or Marvel, would run somewhere between 2 and 4 issues, longer story arcs right around 5 to 6. Uh, Batman just had an arc that was like seven, but you know it's pretty rare for them to get out that far for their storyline. Right. So, <clears throat> all right, we're we're eight to twelve issues in. What do we do in? So the first thing is that Act One is probably going to take uh, issues one, two, and three. So regardless of, of everything, Act One is going to be one, two, and three, and the real rules of Act One are to create a situation or a conflict yeah you're, you're setting up everything as far as you know, as far as the the character and where they're going to be going from there and then act two is really to ratchet up the tension you know create more conflict create more struggle and then from act three you know you take that struggle you finally create the final conflict between the big bad and then you've got like the denouement but the denouement's super short uh, act one and act two, they can stretch pretty much anywhere, but act three, you know, maybe that's two, three issues at that point in time. And you've got your like big conflict kind of coming to a head between, well, if we're talking the way everything's set up, it could be between eight and nine, nine and 10, 10 and 11, 11 and 12. And then you've kind of finish off the storyline going through the final issue. Dead air. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, Keegan's over here drawing, so he's got like all the. I'll he has sh- an I'll, excuse. I'm listening. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw these. Well. I'm gonna throw these sketches like up on the the channel, so that that way you guys can see them. As far as the video is concerned, so that that way you get an idea of what Keegan's doing while we're talking. Um, so, action scene number one: jumping out of a building. Sure. And then we we have to show the aftermath and how they kind of escape at that point in time. At some point, um, there's going to be a flashback. Uh, yeah. I mean, we or are we, we jumping we, right into this? Well, here's the thing, but, right? Uh, that's what I was wondering is that we're going to have to kind of pan back to show their friendship and relationship and maybe kind of slide in all the weird things that show that this guy is not normal. His best friend is not normal. Right, well, kind of hinting and maybe because, you know, this guy's so out there, he's just like, this guy's kind of weird. But I th- he's I th- the only one that talks to me. I might have some conflict with you guys because I think that the first five or six pages, the first half of the first issue is nothing but action. You know, setting up the fact that they are on the run from somebody and, you know, creating that kind of sense of drama, creating that sense of action. And then ultimately, you know, he's adamantly like, I got to go back to my apartment. And that's when we see his like junkie ass apartment. And then it's just like, okay, well, if you've got to go to your apartment, I've got to go to my apartment. And you see the very distinct differences between these two characters. But you leave the sleeper agent guy a mystery. That's actually a really good way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Because so, they're okay, so like we were talking about, you know, this guy's average Joe and then clean cut kind of guy. So they're gonna be co workers, friends at work, but it doesn't sound like, you know Well they probably in, hung out, but they never hung out at the, the, the cool guy's place. They always hung out at his buddy's place. Yeah, and that's you gonna know, be Chris like Pratt's place. Night and day different. Like you said, like you described the main character's house, right? With the pizza boxes and like it's not Filth, but it's it's messy. It's kind of cluttered. There's yeah, get some clothes in the, the corner. The DVD or boxes like that. on the coffee table and cups and dishes in the sink. You know, typical kind of slob. It sounds like your house. It does that. sound <laughs> like my house. I'm making a face for nobody that can see. But I'm yeah. picturing the uh, the sleeper agent's house, and it's got to be like pristine. Like it's got to be. Maybe like, not huge, but like it's got to be like a pretty nice apartment. Almost, almost looks like out of a lives there. Yeah, it yeah. looks almost like a modular 
home or like a catalog home. Basically. Like from straight out of Ikea, except yeah. nicer. I was going to say, I didn't like want to like lowball them. Not yeah, that no, Ikea's, no. Not that Ikea's so, not so, nice. So like but. straight out of like Bloomingdale's or, or like Pottery Barn or I don't know what's expensive yeah. for food. I don't either. But we're on way, a Walmart table look, right here. <laughs> it's got to look really expensive, like very clean, very sleek, modern, not a lot of color. Yeah, no, like very black, black and white. white grays. Oh, yeah. Maybe uh, with a dark hardwood floor or something like that. Yeah. You know, like a really rich stain. A lot of like, books. Like a, a loft kind of kind of feel, so there's not a lot of walls. Uh, you know, big windows, so that that way he can always see out. It's it's very mm-hmm. much got tactical advantages. He's got that cool kind of drawer full of just watches. Yep. And, and he has no, he has nothing on the walls, except for his bookcases. And, and his, what, well, there's one thing. There's got to be one thing on the walls. What's that, Snap? Um, I don't know. It could be something random. I was like, thinking he should have a TV, but it's one of those hidden TVs that only comes out when you watch it. Like okay, it's, cool. It comes down out of the ceiling or something cool. You well, know? no. Well, I mean, why doesn't he just have a projector? Yeah, he might as well. Yeah, he honestly. might as well have a projector screen. You know, so it's just like we just set it up on the top of the wall so that that way, and then the projector screen's down. So, so he we, brings up the projector, and then we, there's one thing on the wall. Are we getting into the point where I mean, this guy is supposed to be super cool, badass, you know, mm-hmm. slick hair, whatever. He's also supposed to be pretending to be an average guy. Yeah, but he doesn't invite people over to his house. Well, like we get into the, that part of the character this, development. This is the hints of I, what that character is. Yeah. So we don't overtly explain it. We do it through context and art. Right. So you get a very distinct feel of the relationship. We don't have to define it in the in the the storyline. We don't have to put like voiceover. We don't have to put conversations. It's just like, dude, I've never been to your apartment. And then all of a sudden, you just see the di- the distinct differences. Like, why the fuck are you hanging out with me? And then the, that could be a box. Like, why the why the bleep are you hanging out with me? Yeah. Like all you the know? information in the page that shows you how he lives should give you the impression that he is without having to say anything. Give you the impression of how different he is. We'll just go with different. Yeah. Okay. Very different. But he doesn't have like the cliche, like all the cool spy stuff is probably hidden in his closet. Full, a drawer full of watches. But that could still be like a normal guy thing. I'm saying yeah. all his spy gear is have you like seen Doctor Strange. Hit a button. Yes, and but that's out. like for you. <laughs> I've only got like four watches, and one of them was a gift for my dad. Well, I, I got one for myself, and I gave one to my dad. So <laughs> that's a very distinct difference right there. But yeah, man, it's anyway. it's just for for anybody that's living, you know, or or has kind of a a, a zest. For the finer things in life, yeah, you can totally understand them taking a small bobble, like a watch or, or a necklace or something like that. Like women wear their earrings and stuff like that. You know, it's just like I would never never wear thousands of dollars on my ears, but I would totally wear a thousand dollar watch. Be- and I would only know. I don't need anybody else to know. But I just like, yeah, it's a really fine timepiece. <laughs> so like, that's that's one of the one of the things that I'm really kind of thinking about for that. But then he's got one thing on the wall. And it's got to be something that's out of place in his okay. apartment. Uh, so I was thinking like. I don't know, African tiki mask. Oh, maybe something <laughs> some kind of weird, ex- like something, like, something, something Polynesian or South African or something like that. Something that is is out of place except for a very distinct and it's perfectly centered, like wall hanging thing. It's so, got like an oni mask on his wall or something. Yeah, like yes. bright red oni mask. Yeah, something something really weird. Well, because then you go over and you like twist the oni mask and then all of a sudden like oh his secret, his secret stash. Yeah, comes that's out. when all the cool spy stuff comes out. That's like the wall of like assault rifles and grenades and all the cool stuff you see in movies happens. And we end issue one. So that's like, that's, you set up the cliffhanger just like, oh, this is who that guy is. Right. But you're still really doing it through the vision. You've got your first person, you've got your perspective coming through the, the standard average Joe character that still does not have a name. So um, I'm just going to go with quotation marks David slash Dave. <laughs> Dave is good because Dave just sounds slash like Dan. A, it, an average name. It's, it's David. Slash, slash Sean. Slash, <laughs> slash Jose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like he's in, he's on one floor. And Is that the running joke? Uh, you, you know, everybody that knows him, that sees him with his buddy, always calls him a different name. I can totally make that work. <laughs> I, can, I can make that happen. That's, that's fantastic. I, I love that. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's a great start. Uh, as we kind of go through, through issue two, like issue two is probably going to give you a lot more context into who they're fighting okay. and, you know, who they're kind of running from, who they're kind of coming up against. So, so secret sleeper agent is going to be protecting David, Sean, Jose. Yep. Uh, that being said, so whoever it is is going to be going after Sean, David, Jose. Yeah, so he's the, he's the target. He is the target. He's the target. So the reason that the sleeper agent is there is more of like a bodyguard capacity. Okay. So he's not, he's not there for, for any particular purpose for himself, 
But as we find out over the course of the story, of course he got attached to their friendship. You know, evidently, this guy, that's when we start to sprinkle in some backstory. Like, as they're kind of on the lamb, on the run, we can do some, some expositionary stuff. Not necessarily super heavy, not a lot of dialogue, but that's when we, you can start to throw in some flashbacks. You know, you get some people hooked in with the action, and then you can start to kind of, like, explain the context in very small doses. Right. So it's just like, dude, you remember when we w used to play on those swing sets? Were you a secret agent then? Like, that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, and it's just like, and then you just show, like, two panels of, like, him swinging on the monkey bars, and then he does, like, a double black flip, back flip, like, dismount, and then, you know, Sticks like, lands on his feet and stuff like that. You know, so, like, that's, that's the kind of stuff that I'm thinking. Better, like, they're playing baseball, and he hits a home run that's, like, just so, it's it just goes so yards. far out of the page, yeah. It is monstrous. <laughs> monstrous. It's almost, like, professional level in, like, middle school, little league, you know? No, I, I, totally, I totally dig that. He always gets, like... <laughs> he he like you you can show him so how far back does this relationship go eventually i understand that we're only on like issue two but uh so if we're talking about like where you'd kind of come in eventually you would realize that this was engineered from birth holy shit yeah yeah, yeah it's crazy right you know engineered from birth this relationship is something that was the product of i don't know whatever's going on with david yeah. sean Jose. Absolutely. He, because he's, he is not only the main character, he is also the MacGuffin. Do you know what a MacGuffin is? I do not know what a so, so MacGuffin is like, uh, think about like the Cosmic Cube or something along those lines, like sure. the Tesseract from, yeah. you know, like the Thor movies or, or something along the Infinity Stones that are going on in Marvel. So the, the MacGuffin is really the kind of like thing that everybody is after. So the MacGuffin can be a person, it can be an item, it can be anything along those lines. So if we're going to make somebody the MacGuffin and he, he's being protected by his best friend, the sleeper agent, which is the working title, um... <laughs> It makes sense that he's like the MacGuffin. He's right. the he's the person that everybody's after, and he's got to have something special about him. So we're not talking. Are we talking military. Are we talking corporate uh, corporate espionage here. Maybe corporate espionage, but with military backgrounds and training. Okay, uh, corporate. So you get a little bit of best, like the best of both worlds. Uh, with military, so here's okay. So if we're thinking about that, so that means that David slash Dave, slash Sean, slash Jose. He needs to be something, he is uh, the byproduct of a combined private sector um, experimentation process that was used to develop advancements for humankind uh, funded by military dollars. Okay. So what we find out is that one of the rival factions, like they're the person that was assigned to protect him, uh, you know, cool guy, who has yet to have a name? What's a cool guy name? Yeah, what is a cool guy name? <clears throat> That's I've been thinking Gage. about that. It's no, good. Gage. What? Wait, Gage. <laughs> what? <laughs> Are you serious? What? <laughs> Do you want to come back next week? For the podcast? <laughs> Don't I mean, shoot he, me down. Come Keegan's, on. Keegan said that he was bad at naming things, but Gage. you set the bar so much higher. I know a Gage. <laughs> I know you know a Gage. So, um, but I mean, like Gage is. I, if we were talking about like a rebellious friend, you know, somebody with like punk rock hair and you know, like a, a, an undercut okay, or something I like that, that seems to fit a little bit more. I don't want to. I don't want to stereotype people. I just want to be clear on that. I don't want to stereotype people. So, <laughs> but, but what I was thinking is that it has has to be something not in descript. You know, right. it has to be like uh, a cool, uh, a cool slick name like like Johnny. You know, something along those lines, right. where it can be associated with a character that is, you know, somebody that want you want to be friends with, but not necessarily overt and over the top. That's like friendly and plain. It's yeah. almost what makes it special and weird is that it's friendly and plain. Yeah, like Johnny or Brad, or, or so, no. something like that. Well, you you don't like Brad's? No, I just I. He was bullied. Even in like a, I don't know. What about like Billy? Just something super plain Jane. It's friendly, but it's, I don't know. It's still, it's vague. That's why it's weird. Okay, like, it's no, it's so that... common that it's weird. It's like, it has a childlike feel to it, but at the same time, you're like, I don't know. I could feel like you might know some really messed up people named Billy at the same time. That's true. It goes both ways. Yeah. So it's just like you know, we've got uh, we. Okay, so uh, we'll just put this down here as uh, Billy Cool Guy. So that's the, uh, the name of our uh, protector, our guardian angel that's going to be taking us through this story. So uh, that's going to be... Our guardian angel. <laughs> our guardian angel, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> Billy the guardian angel. I love that. That's awesome. Uh, so Billy 
is from the opposing faction. So the corporate side wants to get back David because he's the he's a uh, biological experiment. Uh, we we, could, we don't need to define what kind of biological is the experiment he is. You know, he he's could just be, a success. That's all we know. He is the success. You know, so he's a biological experiment, and he is the the success, the only success. So there's no other, to our knowledge, uh, successes that have come out of this, which makes him extremely valuable. The reason that the military and the corporation have agreed to this protection detail is because they're waiting for a gestation period. You know, for okay. whatever process he was successful for to kind of come to fruition, you know, for, for that to reach its, its climactic peak. So it sounds like neither Billy nor David, Jose, Sean knows what that is. David is super in the dark. He didn't even know that his buddy was a sleeper agent. And it's, it's crazy because you have like, uh, this song come on over the office loudspeaker, like by like Taylor Gomez or something like that, you know, like the combination of Taylor Swift and Selena I Gomez gotcha. and, you know, some really cheesy ass pop song or something along those lines. And all of a sudden he runs into, uh, you know, David's cubicle, grabs him, runs and jumps out the window. Like that's how every, like when we flash back to the office and we see the security cam footage and stuff like that in some panels, that's what happened. Like they play it back and then you hear the, like the music kind of like over the captions and then you see him run over, grab him by the arm and you know, like pull out a gun from somewhere or something like that, shoot the glass and jump out the window. Like that's, that's how everything kind of works. So he was activated by Fine. somebody. We don't necessarily know if it was the military side. We don't necessarily know if it was the corporate side but we know that he has orders and the orders need to be carried out for the first three issues or so. Right. So that's when we get to the transition to act two. So at issue number three, we finally get to the point where he is at the end of his orders. And at that point in time, we already know that things are bad. People are hunting him down. They're nondescript. You can't identify them. There's a lot of risk involved. They, they kind of bounce from safe house to safe house. They, they run into people that they know that aren't necessarily helpful or that are put in danger, or people that are kind of like on one side or the other. And then, probably in issue four, we're probably gonna double back to David's apartment for some reason. Because there's probably something from his childhood that's important to everything. Maybe it's like a comfort object, something he's had and keeps it close, but never thinks to really bring out in public. Like due know? to his programming, like something about him, like he's, they've kept something on him that helped him like help the, the process along for this biological process so that that way he could kind of progress as <clears throat> this kind of byproduct of this experiment. And then ultimately it, it, it's the thing that he needs to kind of come to that final part of the development. And that's when we get to introduce Girl Next Door. Yes, girl next door. <laughs> so, so for those of you that are listening along, Mac contributed this part of the story like early on in the process, and and girl like next door is exactly what it sounds like. You know, she is the girl next door. She happens to be the person that he, you know, that David is is sweet on. You know, he's got this kind of crushing relationship. She's always kind of semi, you know, flirtatious advances, those kind of things. And she is going to have a small kind of subplot character development over the course of, of the issue. You're going to love her, you're going to hate her, and then you're going to love her again. You know, that's the whole idea behind it. So we introduce these other characters, somebody that's going to become, like, almost, she is going to create conflict. She's going to be an object of chaos that you can throw into various situations. She's going to kind of struggle to, to understand where the what her surroundings are. She's going to struggle to kind of, she's she's going to, either directly or indirectly break the unity between uh, Cool Guy Billy and David so that that way we can kind of get some of that tension inside the relationship. So that would be, that'd be a really cool kind of device on that. And then ultimately she's got to play an integral part in the, in the plot. Right. Because we can, we can go through with, you know, having three or four characters and have it really be a, a really solid story. So first off, you've got some, you've got the antagonist. So the antagonist is... Uh, big bad evil guy, which we you know flesh so, out. He's either the head of the military, he's head of the corporation, something along those lines, and he has various reasons for that, and they're obviously nefarious. <laughs> those are you know like that's that's how those things work. So we've got big bad evil guy, and then we're going to have to have some sort of parental figure, so that that way we can have some understanding as to why these things happen and how he got into this situation. Okay. So that's going to have to play a part in the story. We have the love interest. 
not necessarily a conflicted love interest. One of the best things about Cool Guy Billy is that he is he's almost mechanical in nature. Right. So he's not hitting on girl next door. Exactly. You know, you would assume that he would be able to get anybody that he wants, but he's not because you know he's his friend, and cool it's just guy like Billy. it's just like Cool Guy Billy is the cool guy. He is like the wingman from heaven because he's his guardian angel. Yeah, you're smirking. It's it's. I realize it's not that funny, but I appreciate the. I, I appreciate that. So, okay. So it sounds like we've got a little bit more. We've definitely got enough for for probably six or seven issues at this point in time. Uh, we've got. If you throw in the twist and and some of those things, you've got uh, some pretty good ideas that could take you out to eight or nine. So I think that we've got a pretty good understanding of where everything's going to sit as far as length is going to go. So what kind of world do these guys live in? Well, you said skyscraper. I immediately thought uh, cityscape of some form or another. You know, New York, Chicago, something like that. All right. So, um, are we thinking like coastal? We thinking inland? You know, what 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 kind of scenes do you want to draw, Keegan? Yeah, that's for some point. reason, I picture this town. I don't picture like a major metropolis. I don't picture a small town in the middle of nowhere. You but thinking like Concord, I'm Manchester? Think, no, bigger than, like kind of like Woburn, Mass. Woburn? Woburn? I've like, <laughs> Woburn? <laughs> <laughs> we're from a state over from Massachusetts, but I don't know how to say their names. Yeah, kind of like that. Like, it's close enough to Boston, but it's not in the heart of, like, a metropolis. There's enough skyscrapers and business districts, but it just seems like a kind of a plain area outside of that. So does he does he work there? Does he live there? Is he a train guy? You know, bridge and tunnel? or I imagine them driving there, but I imagine there being traffic. Okay. So you, you imagine him driving there, but you imagine him dream, being traffic. So do we start off in a little bit more metropolitan area and then come back to where they live and where they live is in that kind of like kind smaller of more like city? Kind like a suburb, kind of more, not rural, but a less metropolitan area. So there's, a, there's distinct risk involved going to both of their places. Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. Def- definitely distinct risk. So I, I, I dig on that. Are we, talking, uh, are we talking coastal city? Are we talking inland city? I was thinking more coastal, but I think it's just because we live you know, closer to the ocean than not. So it could be middle America. Well, so here's the, here's the thing, right? You know, if we're talking about escaping or trying to get to a specific location, the location that they need to get to to complete the, the orders, it's not local. You know, it's not in the same city. It's yeah. like they need to get from Boston to D.C. or they need to get from Chicago to St. Louis or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. So we've got different modes of transport. You know, we could do boats. We could do trains. We could do buses. We could do cars. You know, are we talking stealing car scenes and char- car chases? Or are we talking like, like Mystery on the Orient Express stuff? You know, like how do we want to set the tension? I feel like every cool spy movie has a scene where someone drives a coat, I mean, a coat, a boat onto your, a, I can't even talk right now, a car onto a boat. There we go. Oh, so you want to Every jump a single, car you onto want to a boat? Do full James Bond, but in reverse. Or the or the transporter? No, I, I or Fast and Furious. Not a boat onto a car. That's that would never work. I just said that wrong. But a car onto a boat. Some kind of cool boat scene. I feel like some expensive yacht. I don't know. I, I might just be copying every single thing I've ever seen in a spy movie. you got to take inspiration from someplace, man. I just figured this is like a fun spy adventure that doesn't take itself too, too seriously, but still has heavy action. So and cars so, going onto boats at high speed is fun action. So do you want to get a do you want to get a little bit more risky and go like motorcycle onto a train or motorcycle onto a boat? Because the Ooh. the idea of two grown men on a motorcycle that's hilarious. That's very funny. Yeah, especially since one of them looks like a professional everything, and, and the then other the other one, person's on the back like ah, just screaming their head off. <laughs> oh yeah, you know what? Let's do that. I like yeah. that. Okay, cool. Uh, so motorcycle. I like the chase. idea of him freaking out on the back of a pretty much a sport Help bike me that's God. not meant for two people. And then you have two grown men yeah. on the back of this tiny little thing zipping through the cities. I like this. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a scene. That's, that's in there. All right. <laughs> so I, I'm pretty sure that we just decided that you're going to draw a hellacious cityscape <laughs> with a motorcycle. I actually was thinking about that right before you said it, and that's, that's going to be a challenge. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely... It's I might have just put myself into a Well, here's position. the thing, right? We don't have to put it in the first five pages. So... Oh, uh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's do it then. I, I think we should do this. Okay, cool. Uh, awesome. So we're, we got a motorcycle chase uh, jumping onto a boat, which is awesome. So coastal city. <laughs> um, so how are they going... Oh, so we're, we're going to talk about... After that, like... What kind of vision do we have for this place that they have to get to? I mean, are we dealing with, you know, 
something that's in plain, like hiding in plain sight, like shadow government kind of stuff? Are we talking like underground bunkers? What kind of, you know, like real nitty gritty do we get into when it comes to the setting of the people that we're dealing with? Because we can use the setting that we're setting, we're putting them in to kind of create context for who they are. I imagine them looking like a pretty typical office building, kind of like, um, you know, this giant, you know, big office buildings you see off of like highways. They're not really that descript. You don't even know, know what they are. It's just, you know, they're a large business. And I've, but inside is completely different. Maybe the first couple floors are normal. And then underneath that is all of the labs or whatever it is they're doing. It's almost like how Resident Evil always has the Umbrella Corporation all the has wacky the giant stuff tunnels downstairs. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like that. So it looks like a normal office building, just a very large one. So I guess that to me, it really depends on what we plan to do. You know, what is the resolution? What is the conflict going on? Why is he traveling somewhere else? I understand they're trying to kill him, but... Oh, they're not trying to kill him. They're trying to get him back. Yeah, they're trying to acquire him. Right. Non-lethal means to start. So where are they going? Are they going to, like, blow up the facility they're trying to take him to? Oh, or? no, this is, this, is, this is like we're completing the orders. You know, like, as we kind of get the understanding as to what the orders are, we bring them back in, like, issue four, issue five, and then we finally get to this facility, you know, that we're talking, you know, the, the people that kind of ordered him to come back, and then we get a little bit more backstory, we get a little bit more insight as to what created the conflict between the corporate entity and the middle, military entity, and then we can provide, you know, we don't know who's in the right or who's in the wrong at this point in time. Oh, so you okay. can play a little bit of a dichotomy because evidently both people are trying to acquire him. Right. You didn't necessarily, you don't necessarily know that at the start, but then it's just like, these are different guys trying to chase him down than the other guys. So like, as soon as broke protocol, it's like, they know they you know, it's like, oh yeah, no, no, come, come with us. We're, we're going to, mm, we're going to try and save you. And it's like, this is our contact. You know, they're, they're in phone booths and stuff like that, using secret codes and punching numbers and shit like that. And to make it so that that way there's, right. there's all this stuff going on. It's setting up a little bit more of a, of a larger scale. However, the real big thing, twist number one is probably that the ar the orders aren't what Billy thought they were. So once they get there and they find out exactly what they're planning to do with him, that's when we see Billy turn. So he's got to make his he's got to make his stand to defend his friend. Right. And it puts him on the run from both of them. Along with Jose. Well, yeah, no, no. So David and Bill, David and Billy, they're 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 Tango and Cash, man. You know, they're they're Riggs and Murtaugh. They're they're inseparable, basically. These are these are partners until the end of this book, and what we're gonna get is uh, Sandy, girl next door. Uh, you know, Sa Sandy, the girl next door. She is going to help facilitate the escape from this first installation, like. Probably yeah no I I've got some really cool ideas for how that could, how that could work you know how we could set things up in terms of art how we could set things up in terms of like dialogue and you know drop some subtle hints and stuff like that some clues and earlier issues that kind of give you an idea as to where that's going to be going and then so that, that way when the twist hits you it's it's you're just like ah yeah you know just it's 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 good Glory and then success and then you gotta have twist number two which ratchets things up even more because according to a lot of different, you know, like fantasy writers or comic book writers, the role of a writer is to take a character and put them in harm's way and then continue to make things worse until they have no other choices except to fight the big bad guy at the end. So like you start out, that makes sense. you start out, you have to run away from home. You go to the place that you think safe. All of a sudden the th place that you think safe is no longer safe. And the person that was helping you out is dead. And then you go into the place where you think that you need to go so that that way you can kind of like create a middle ground or at least, you know, put things on hold. And then that's no longer safe. And then you get to the point where you have no more options. You have no more places to run. So the only conflict that you can really have, the only thing you can really do is go head on at them. And then that's where David really comes into his own. Because after we talk about, you know, like we take the like half of issue five going into issue six, and we take the time to explain why David's special. And then we give him the tools that he needs to become a better man and a better character and to utilize those things. So at that point in time, we're talking about the real big turn as far as progression for him. And then we're going to have to have a real serious thing happen that really just forces him to do that. He's got, he's got to become a man whether he wants to or not. 
Right. You know, that, that, that whole birds jumping out of the nest. You know, f- fly or fall. Shit's going to happen. Yep. And he's, you know, that's when he spreads his wings, reluctantly, but then ultimately he gets to come into his own before we go into the final, final act, final conflict. Boss battle, whatever. Yeah, big boss battle. Yep. Absolutely. So, like, we're talking Billy's in danger, things look grim, everything's going to fall apart, and then, poof, here comes David with his... Abilities or, or whatever, yeah, whatever. We we can be. we can come up with some really cool stuff for that. You know, awesome. like there's a you, you can go you can go contrived. You know, he's a genetic mutation and he's got this gene that's gonna you know allow humans to live for two hundred years, or something along those lines. You know, he's the next evolution of of mankind. He's a bio weapon that they're trying to set off in some por- sort of populated area. You know, there's yeah, all these different he's the kind incubating of period for some kind of virus, right? Yeah, he's he's a chemical weapon on his own. Something he's a, like the T virus. If we're going, he no. That's the second Resident Evil <laughs> reference in this podcast tonight. I, I was gonna say I'm pretty sure that's close to the third because when he was talking about that actor's name, yep. I swear he wanted to say Mila Jovovich. That's what I was trying for. <laughs> well, that's, that's a chick. Yeah, that's not even and the right gender. Yeah, she's she's no, excellent. because I was thinking Girl Next Door the entire time. Oh, yeah, but that's uh, I that. that's Alicia Cuthbert. If we're talking about the Girl Next Door movie, that's the, no, no, the blonde no, no. one. But like her as, because I don't think she's attractive, but. You don't think Mila Jovovich is, is attractive? What if she's I think listening? she's attractive, but the other one is. You don't think Alicia Cuthbert's attractive? Oh, dude, you have weird standards. <laughs> what if she's listening right now? Like, God forbid she just tuned into this podcast, took a risk. Moving she's never on. never going to listen again. You know what? She's like, that Mac motherfucker, <laughs> screw him. Or wait a minute, I'm not going to screw him. It's like, your chance, gone. <laughs> We can yeah, swear on this podcast. Can we swear on this? I've been trying to like refrain. I didn't know if that was cool. I mean, uh, just a warning and disclaimer: there might be adult language here. We are adults and we are drinking, so that might be a thing. Uh-huh. Cool. Um, if we're going in the direction of his special genetics or any kind of disease he might have or special abilities, maybe the building where this big conflict should happen should be in what appears to be a pretty normal hospital, and then underneath the hospital is all the the funky stuff. Like maybe the front is a hospital, but it's a very special kind of. I like that hospital. Ooh, that is. That I like is, that a um, lot because that would be all of the. That's pretty much where he would have been, not made per se, but all the plans for his life were set in this building. And I don't know about you guys, but like medical stuff kind of freaks me out. So it's uncomfortable to draw weird medical scenes of tanks and things floating in them and hospital beds and needles. Well, that's where I he, think that's where he was intended to be patient zero. Like, first off, he was created there, but mm-hmm. then also, like, part of this failsafe, part of this thing uh, is that he's, he's going to get sick to a point. And then they were going to transfer him there so that that way it could, you know, whatever was going to happen was going to happen very naturally in a place that you'd expect it to be. So, like, this was the planned destination all along. So it's either him going to accept fate or fight against it. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Mac made a very dramatic head movement, so I had to add some sort of sound effect to right, kind of like necessitate like, totally that. Forget. Because he forgets that people can't see him other than me and Keegan. <laughs> so <laughs> for context, uh, anytime that, you know, there's a, a sound or a lack of sound, that's probably because one of us is like making a, a weird face or something like that to, to necessitate what we're feeling at that point in time. And then we have to, to like put context into <laughs> words at that point in time. We are so, amateurs, so bear with us. Yeah, this is, this is the first one. So, so, you know, check it before you wreck it. Um, <laughs> So we're, we've got patient, patient zero, ground zero for this uh, disaster that they have to avert. And then they're going to come into the final conflict with a big bad guy. You got so, it. So um, those are – we don't want to spoil these things. We want to give you guys a good idea as to what the story is really going to pertain to see if, you, if it's something that you know, might be interesting, something that we can develop a little bit further. We need to have enough bones. You know, we, have a really, we have to have a really good skeletal structure in order – for this to make sense. So like when I'm plotting these things out, like I've got an idea of like, I've got an, an emotional timeline almost as we kind of go through, you know, issue, you know, one, issue three, issue six, issue nine. And then there's these various ups and downs that are going to take us to different places or, you know, emotionally. And then finally we're going to hit a crescendo and then we're going to go towards the end. So that way we can take different scenes and plot out where those scenes go. So it's just like if there's this really cool action that we want to put in there, if there's this really cool emotional moment, or if we want to create this twist or this turn, we can actually plot those out down to which page it's going to happen on. And what I'm going to do with the, with the script, you know, you've got these page turns, right? Like if you're looking at a comic book, you know, you usually set up a, dr- a dramatic event on the page after you flip it over. 
So right. it's designed to be like you have a cliffhanger and then a reveal, and that's like every single page turn of a comic book, or at least that's what it should be. You know, if you want to kind of well, if if you're, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but if you want to create a little bit more drama, that's kind yeah, of yeah. There's the, some suspense built there. Absolutely, like that's the idea. Building, Otherwise, you're just interrupting action. Exactly. You know, it's it's. Uh, and then we want to. I, I think that this is pretty pretty conversation light. What do you think? Like, there's there's not a lot of dialogue that takes place unless it's between really serious characters. Right. I mean, there's not a lot going on between the two, the government agency or the corporation. It's mostly you get the gist of the fact that everybody wants David, and then the only maybe Sandy's talking to David and Billy, and that's about that. And I don't know if we decided that her name's Sandy, but... Say, when did we decide her name was It just was kind Sandy. of appeared. I, I said it, and oh, then okay. I ran with it. Uh, so <laughs> can that's we call just... her Sandra, at least? Oh, no, no we, can, we can totally call her Sandra. I like... Because Sandy's just... Well, here's... Okay. Sandy's girl every, next door. Every, everyone calls her Sandra, except she lets David call her Sandy. Oh. Okay. I can, I can compromise on that. Okay, cool. But... All right. So, Sandra... Exclamation point. <laughs> so, so yeah, no, there's, there, we can plot a bunch of really cool scenes when it, when it comes to those kind of things. There's a lot of emotional stuff that you can really work into here because you've got to flesh out the relationship between Billy and David. Uh, you know, you've got to kind of create context for why they would bring along Sandy. You know, if Billy is, is obviously against it, but he's, he's, he's cool guy Billy. So right. he's, he's just like, I totally understand where you're coming from. They're going to probably torture her or kill her or something along those lines. So, yeah, no, I can handle the both. I can handle the three of us. I can make this work. Um, so that's good. Uh, you know, you've got the, the fatherly, motherly figure, however you kind of want to plan that out. You've got all this exposition that's going to happen, but it's going to happen in a very... It, we can probably pre-set up a bunch of exposition, and we can probably take care of it in a good amount of visuals. I don't want right. to information download too much, but I think that we're pretty pretty conversation light, except when it comes to character development pieces. So we can... Well, that's how you get the attachment. Yeah, that's the, that's the whole idea. We want to create an emotional connection. Uh, you know, we want to be able to feel the emotional connection between Billy and between David and the, you know, the kind of aspiring nature of David towards Sandy and, you know, like her kind of coy acceptance of it. Uh, I don't necessarily want to say, you know, that she's open to a relationship at this point in time or something along those lines, but she always gives him the feeling that she has, that he has a chance, (laughs) which is either the best or the worst thing that you, a girl could do. (laughs) It's, it's just like, so you're saying there's a chance. (laughs) So, but you know, it it gives you a reason for these people to to kind of be together at that point in time. And then you've got a very, mm, I love the idea of cold calculating and emotionless as far as the villain's concerned. Yeah. You know, like, well, he doesn't necessarily Why? have to... Why, because you're a robot? I am a robot, yeah. <laughs> I am very much a robot, so I feel like I need somebody to associate with, somebody that I can relate to. Uh, what it comes down to is that I, I, I want him to be, you know, if we're talking about either corporate or we're talking about military, those are characteristics that seem to be idolized in, you know, the structure. Because if you're talking about a cold, calculating person in the military, you know, they usually achieve very serious ranks. You know, they, they right. get up to, like, colonels, generals, that kind of stuff, and they start planning military operations. But the thing is, if they don't have the moral integrity, that's when they switch over to the, the dark side or, you know, something along those lines. The same thing happens in corporate structure. You know, if you're a bottom-line numbers kind of guy and you can produce those kind of numbers and, and something along those lines... And People you can, stop caring where that kind of comes from. Yeah, so yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll move you. You'll get recognized for that kind of stuff. So... I like the idea, if we're talking about like a subplot or subtext to how everything is, kind of creating heroism and friendship as like the positive message of the story, and then that kind of cold isolationist feel as kind of like the negative portion. I, I don't want to be like political and stuff like that, but it's a very good general statement. Because if it comes out like, it, you know, you're, the way to win is to be cold, are you leaving? I'm getting ready to leave. <laughs> Why are you leaving? <laughs> because you said something about politics. Yeah, I'm I know. Ready. And then didn't really follow up with anything political. And then no, no, no. That's why I was the getting ready to leave. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I'm not going to talk about politics. Okay. I've already said multiple times on my channel, I don't do that. That's not my, that's not my thing. Politics okay. are, you have your thing, I have my thing, doesn't matter. Okay. But, you know, kind of creating that, that support structure, creating that system of that, that bond between those two people, that... You know, idolizing that versus the the cold isolationist nature of 
Yeah, the, and the it kind guy. of breaks it down to friendship. You know, love of a form is stronger than the evil overcoming that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I totally that. I'm, I think that we're we're kind of on the same page as to uh, to where that really goes. So, is this something that is going to be a one and done, or could it turn into a second and third series? It, mm. Like a spinoff or like a longer continuation? Like a longer continuation. We plan for a maxi series, but is this something that you could see coming really, into a second plot line or a third plot line or something along those lines? Doesn't that really depend on what happens to David? It depends on who David is. Yeah. And what David is. Yeah. And, and of course, the outcome. Um, and, of course, what happens to Sandy? Well, yeah. I mean, what happens to Billy? What happens to Billy? I mean, I'd say that Billy's probably more important than Sandy. I mean... Well, the... the uh, Depending on how Keegan is at drawing women, I'm just saying. I'm sure that she's going to be fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure she's going to be Thanks hot. Thanks for your vote of confidence. <laughs> I'm, sure she, I'm sure she's going to be hot as hell. Um, but it's not necessarily about that. It's, right. it's not about what happens between David and Sandy because the main emotional driver is the relationship between Billy and David. So, it, of course, we're going to care about what happens to Sandy yeah. because she's going to insert herself as a, as a key point in this story. And I like that it's going to be her inserting herself. Sorry about that. You know, any kind of innuendo that you pulled on, pulled off that. The wording was it, the phrasing was a little unique. bit poor. It, it was, was a little bit poor in that respect. Phrasing but, point. Yeah. So I, I like the idea of her kind of like putting herself in this situation, uh, and whatever kind of outcome happens from her her overall plot arc that's going to determine the relationship and how everything kind of moves forward with all of these characters not necessarily just david not necessarily just billy but when it comes down to it we have a man that is either genetically modified or a biological weapon or something along those lines is going to be wandering you know after his success he might be wandering around like he might be out in the wild right he's trying to Either he tries to go back to the life he was living, which probably he doesn't want to do. Well, especially not after the character journey he's going to have. You know, right. everything's going to seem boring as fuck. You know, you're just not going to want to be. It's like I want to go back to data entry well, and living well, in maybe my that's terrible apartment. Maybe that's the thing. Maybe he just wants to be that normal guy. He sounds boring then. But well, he, that's we've the already idea. established. No, <laughs> we've already he established starts though that he wants to be something. He wants more. to be like, more. He's already on. The way I'm picturing this guy is like very, um, he had potential or he thinks he had potential, but just nothing's really happening. Like he's almost in like a quarter life crisis, a bit of an existential crisis being like, why am I like, what is Okay, so just nothing's gone right for this guy so far. I wouldn't say it's gone wrong. Like maybe he's he's, average though. He's average and doesn't want to be average. Like maybe he had uh, an opportunity and he didn't take the right scholarship and maybe he didn't push himself to take that engineering course. You know, maybe right. he, you know, if we're talking about his, his effort didn't match his, ex, his expectations met up with his, uh, with his effort. So he didn't put in the effort that was necessary. So he ended up becoming a person that, you know, was of Midland expectations. He ended up in a, in a middleweight job that he didn't really enjoy and in a life that he didn't really enjoy. And Billy kind of came and, you know, stayed there with him. So it's, it's, you know. If anything, they're almost in an abusive relationship. I know, say, David's oh really God. holding him back. I was going to say, <laughs> do you think that maybe uh, he's almost in some weird way kind of slightly jealous of Billy? Maybe not jealous, but he's like, what are you doing? Like, you have so much more potential. Like, I wish I had what you had. Everyone likes you. Like, people like throw themselves at you. That could be part of the tension. You have this weird stoic energy and like everyone wants to promote you or, you know, sleep with you, whatever. And Billy just kind of puppy dogs David, who's... Pretty bland, right? He's well, pretty... I wouldn't necessarily say that he's like a follower. He's not a follower, but, but, like but he, he thinks he's a follower of him because he doesn't know why he hangs out with him. Well, he okay. doesn't know his intention. There are there are a few different ways that you could really tweak this emotionally. Yeah. That you know, I wouldn't want to get into to too many details here because it's going to take me a while to flesh them out. <laughs> but I've got some really cool ideas on on the uh, the relationship between Billy and David. That's that is where the heart of this story really comes into play. Relationship, Billy, David, and the question is why. The overall question is why. First off, why isn't David a better man? Why isn't he more successful? And the second question is why is Billy not what he can be? And that's the the, the fundamentals of that. And I think I think that kind of lays the foundation for for how we're going to define the relationship between these two characters 
over the course of the entire story. Uh, it's it just always comes down to the simplest stuff. Yeah, that's that's really what I think about it. It always comes down to the simple things. It's just like why you, why me, why us, why this. Right. How are we gonna, you know, where are we gonna go from here after everything's said and done? You know, as you said, we're looking at. Is this going to be a one-off, or are we going to move forward? Are we going to expand on the relationship that these characters have? Or, you know, this is their riding off into the sunset. I think that the the way that you... I think the way that we set up the ending, it's got to be kind of ambiguous, but you want to definitely wrap up any loose ends as far as the plot and the storyline's concerned, other yes. than a few major things that you could use later on down the road. Right. And if we feel really ambitious about it, we could definitely pepper the story with some cool Easter eggs and stuff like that that you can kind of hide in the background and hide in the dialogue that could set up offshoots that would really take it into the future. So I think personality-wise, these two guys, I think Billy should be very stoic. Like, yep. but Same page. Yeah, I think he should be very stoic. Like, It's not that he's emotionless, but I think that's going to help show his intellect and his fighting ability mm -hmm. when he just turns into an absolute animal he's fighting machine, yeah. other people right so he's gonna be the stoic like kind of like huh you know huh, what's up guys very almost seems simple to people who don't know him but then he just is a like i said he's a machine as opposed to david who seems kind of lazy always looks tired bags under his eyes not out of shape, but like slightly out of shape. However, he has got emotions. Like he is, he's very yeah. uh, animated when it yes. comes to various things. Like you can feel the fear that pours off of him. Like throughout he the, speaks the more than part. Billy will ever talk. Yeah. Right. Like for for every like five word balloons from David, you get like one from Billy, and it's just like, yeah. <laughs> you know, not necessarily like that, but it's it's a very simple, it's a very concise response, and it definitely plays into the character the that he has. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that we have a really solid concept here. I think we've got a lot of really cool ideas, and I think we've got a lot of places to go for this. But I'm kind of curious what everybody out there listening to this thinks, because by the time this, guy, this gets posted, we're going to have a lot more art. We're going to have some sketches. We're going to have the actual finished five pages that's going to set up what we would consider to be the first issue, lettered, inked, and online. Uh, that's going to be on the website. You can see that in the description for the, the video as well as for the podcast. So I'm really, I'm really excited about this concept. Like when we thought about it, I'm like, ah, eh, that's just kind of like, you know, a throwaway title, like, uh, you know, the, the computer wore tennis shoes or something along those lines, or <laughs> the man with one red shoe, like those eighties kind of like accidental spy movies. <laughs> those are like my two favorite movies. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I think they were wronged by not getting Oscars. That's, that's very telling Keegan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm completely lying. <laughs> I, I understand that. I, I, I know, but they don't. Okay. So I was lying for the record. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to wrap this up here. If everybody seems like that we've got a, a pretty good handle on where everything's kind of going. So, uh, signing off from detail comics, I'm Stan. Uh, you can follow me on detail comics on YouTube and, uh, I've evolution of Stan on Twitter and Instagram. I'm Keegan. Uh, for now, just Instagram website to come. Thanks for listening. Okay. And I'm Mac, the comic bystander, and really just here to enjoy. Yeah. Uh, well, hopefully you guys enjoy as well. So uh, stick around for the next episode when it comes out, and uh, make sure you check out the art and give us a lot of feedback on exactly what's going on. And make sure that if you want to stick around and get more of this content, hit subscribe, and don't forget to like the video, comment below. We'd love to start that conversation. Have a good night, guys.